Greetings all. No more vehicles filmed to release for a while until this COVID business is over and done with. So on to other matters, I have a bit of a backlog and I am long overdue for going over one of the basics of tanking, range finding. Now this is no small matter. There are a slew of variables that can affect the tank's accuracy and generally speaking they come under three categories, mechanical, atmospheric or human. At its most fundamental level, range finding is a human matter. The mechanical side of things can only assist. And of all the various different variables, range is far and away the most critical to get right. And it's not too difficult to see why. All you have to do is just look at the arc of flight of a fired round. At closer ranges, the difference in height between the arc of fire to the line of sight is pretty minimal, as the trajectory is more flat than not. The further out you go though, the arc increases dramatically as the horizontal component of speed drops dramatically due to drag and friction, whilst the vertical component remains the same due to gravity being a constant. An army paper of the 1950s estimated that effective accurate range doubles with a 50% increase in velocity as a result of this process, giving an example of one reason why high velocity guns are considered to be more accurate. The US Army, well, as it does with many things, has performed various studies on this subject. The simplest way for a tank crew to determine range is to just estimate it. In common terms, a swag. According to the Army, a typical person is able to estimate to within about 20% the range to target within about two kilometers. The Army also believes that if well trained, that range estimation error can be reduced to about 15%. That actually sounds pretty good, at least until one contrasts it with the diagram of the trajectory. Again, the Army has presented an example to make it easy for us, and it used the 90mm gun of the M48 as the test case. If the tank is placed in front of a target at 500 yards, and the visual estimate of the range is short by 15%, the gun is going to be elevated only sufficiently so as to hit a target at 425 yards. Yes, I know, bear with me, the US Army hadn't gone to metric yet at the time that this example was written. That means that the shot would actually land about 7 inches below the point of aim, barring you know, dispersion factors. Now against a tank sized target like this, 7 inches is not really a critical issue. However, if the target were at 2,000 yards and the range was estimated short with the same error of 15%, that means that the gun is going to be elevated for a target at 1,700 yards. The round is going to impact well short of the target on an arc which would be over 12.5 feet below the point of aim by the time it got to 2,000 meters if you were to draw the line further you know, beyond the ground. Something better is required. Now the simplest answer is to simply not bother with range finding at all, find the best general purpose range calculation and fire with that. That is the battle sight range, used when there is no time to range the target or when the better range finding systems are all broken. Also it is known as maximum point blank range. Now the theory is that from 0 meters to a certain distance, no matter how far away that target is, the round will never fly at a height known as the maximum ordinate, which is higher than the typical target that you were shooting at. So for the M1, battle sight for Sabo is about 1200 meters. So from 0 to 1200 meters, the round will impact the T72 above the point of aim, maybe even as high as the roof line at about 750 meters. At about 1200 to 1600 meters, the round will impact the T72 below the point of aim. And at over 1600 meters, you will probably fall short of the target. Older tanks with lesser velocity cannon have shorter battle sight ranges. And for some reason, I have 800 meters stuck in my mind for the M26's 90 millimeter, uh, by way of example. But that may be my completely making it up since I can't find the actual reference. But I, you get the idea. Another quick fix for the above is the burst on target method. And it's still used today for some simple fire control systems, such as the Bradley I had back 10 years ago, which in fairness was actually one of the oldest in service. The gun is aimed using the estimated range and a round is fired. It is critical to observe the location of the impact of the round. If the target is missed, 
the gunner is required to relay the gun using the TLAR method so that the second round fire is adjusted onto the target by aiming off to compensate from wherever it was that the previous round landed. This is basically the system used by tanks which have a ranging machine gun, such as early chieftains. It just uses a smaller gun for the first burst that you would just off of. Still, this is absolutely nowhere near ideal. If one has the chance, the next bet is to create a range card. Now, I'm sure folks used to hate doing these, I have no idea, but the principle is simple. If you're in a defensive position, you figure out the lay of the land before the fight happens. If this means taking a jeep and driving in a straight line to a landmark and then looking at the odometer to see how far you've gone, so be it. If you can't go that far, there are other techniques you can use to help with range estimation. So for example, telephone poles are normally fairly equally spaced alongside a road. So if a road happens to be going down range, you simply count how many telephone poles there are and multiply by the known distance between poles. You will know then that when an enemy is passing, say, that gate over there, that they are such and such a distance away. And when they are by, say, that shrubbery, the, you know, the one beside the other one, only a little higher for the two layer effect with a little path running down the middle, then they are well, whatever distance away that is, and so on. If there's nothing at all, well, you just make your own range markers. Just be sure they're only visible from your side. You can also estimate off those markers, such as it's about 100 meters closer than reference point number three. Now, as I heard, they still make you draw out range cards, even in modern tanks with thermals and laser rangefinders, mainly because at night, especially things like dead ground and the like don't necessarily show up well through a thermal. So to help the crews out, tanks are now issued with rangefinders. Now, there is an important criterion other than accuracy when using a rangefinder, and that is speed. It's all very well being accurate, but if the rangefinding process takes too long, it's not necessarily helpful. If one uses a mechanical rangefinder which can estimate range and then adjust a ballistic computer in, say, 15 seconds for an 80% chance of a first round hit, that sounds great. But if one is going up against a tank which is using the burst on target method, it gets its first shot off after about five seconds, it misses, reloads, aims off in the next five seconds for a second round hit, then the extra accuracy in one's own tank has suddenly become a little bit academic. The next level of rangefinder, and the one which is pretty much a dominant one for years, is the optical rangefinder. Acoustic may predate this on the land battlefield, but they aren't really tank compatible. Optics, by and large, come in four categories. Stadiometric, stereoscopic, coincidence, and flicker. All four of them work on the basis of a right angle triangle off of a known base. For three of them, that known base is the firing tank, and on the fourth, that's the target. The fourth one is also the simplest of the lot, stadiometric. It basically takes into account the fact that as one looks out, the rays of light spread outward at a known rate. Though this can be measured in degrees, it is commonly measured in milliradians or mils for two reasons. Firstly, because of increased precision. And, and a side note, people confuse precision with accuracy. They are not the same thing. In digression over. There are 360 degrees in a circle, but there are some 6,283 mils in a circle, unless you're in the military, in which case it's a number between 6,000 and 6,400. Secondly, because it makes the mathematics much simpler. So a neat feature about a mil, if you take an item one meter wide and you place it at 1,000 meters, the angle between one side of this item as you're looking at it and the other is one mil. So you can tell that if you were looking at something three meters wide and it takes up three mils on your scale, it's also at 1,000 meters. Or if it takes up 1.5 mils, it's 2,000 meters, or six mils at 500 meters. It's called the worm formula. Range in thousands equals width over mils. I'm not quite sure how one gets a worm from that, but anyway. Width is commonly used for three reasons. Firstly, most military vehicles tend to be three to four meters wide. They're all limited in size by the railway loading gauges, and those are reasonably similar around the world. A tank can approach four meters, IFVs tend to be about three and a quarter. 
Secondly, enemy vehicles often are coming at you, so it's easier to see width than length. And thirdly, height can be an issue if there are some visual obstacles covering the bottom of the vehicle. The catch is that, to be accurate, you have to know by heart the various dimensions of enemy vehicles. Or at least maybe something physically located near the enemy vehicle that you know the size of that you can then estimate off. In any case, it's so basic a concept that basically any optic in the military has a mill scale on it somewhere. From a pair of binoculars through to the primary laser sight of the M1 Abrams. And yes, the reticle is later generated. Mill scales on some tank sites go back to before World War II, and you will see mill reticles on anything from Panzer III's and STRV M38's to BT's and Stuart's. The same principle is used for the other form of common stadiometric sight, the choke sight. Now these come in two main variants, horizontal and funnel. They are, however, more approximations as they are designed against a set specific size target. So for example, the auxiliary sight on the M1 is designed that range can be easily estimated against a T-72 tank by placing the sight over it such as the top and bottom lines match with the roof and ground contact of the tank. If your target is somewhat taller than a T-72, say an M60, your range estimate using this technique will be too short. Now this is just a horizontal range finder. All it does is it tells you the range which you then need to apply to your sight picture. The funnel sight not only helps you to determine range, it also applies correct super elevation to the gun when it does so. Simply place the target on the vertical line in the middle of the sight. Elevate until the target touches the curved lines on each side. Your gun should now be elevated to such that rounds will impact on the target at that range, assuming that the distance between the lines is calibrated for that type of target. So for the 90mm recordless rifle shown here, that's a Soviet tank. For the Bradley, it's a BMP. Quite how critical the difference in target size is compared to the reference size used is dependent upon the velocity of the ammunition and the range to target, and this goes back to the earlier diagram of trajectory. So that's stadiometric. It requires an estimated target size, but also requires no particular equipment, just etchings into the glass in the optic. The next three require more complicated equipment, and all three work on the basis of knowing the base of the triangle, which is in practical terms defined as the distance between the two lenses on the side of the tank, one of which is adjustable in order to align the two to a certain distance out front. The next type of optic along, at least in the sequence that the US Army played with, is stereoscopic. So for a stereoscopic rangefinder, imagine it as a ginormous pair of binoculars. As you look through a pair of binoculars, the lenses are completely parallel, with a merge distance technically of infinity. And as you're looking through, you kind of automatically focus your eyes on whatever it is that you're interested in, and this gives you depth perception. The only control that you need worry about is focus, you know, a little knob on top of the binoculars. But you don't need to align the lenses with mirrors or anything. Your eyeballs will do that for you in order to see the target clearly. So what you would see through either the bare binoculars or the stereoscopic rangefinder is basically the normal image that you would see from your unassisted eyeballs, just that it's magnified. On the stereoscopic rangefinder, however, etched into glass are ranging marks. Now these marks are on plates of glass and the glass can be moved in order to determine the range. The operator adjusts the range setting. The marks are then moved in the sight picture. The process is known as flying the geese because the moving V resembles a flock of geese in flight. When the mark appears to be at the same distance downrange as the target, because of the angles of the marks to your eyeballs, you have your range. The catch is that to properly use the thing required a specific level of training, and one report suggested you needed 22 hours over 13 days as well as having a certain visual depth acuity which some people quite simply aren't born with. Now I have not yet encountered a functioning stereoscopic rangefinder that I can use to figure out just how the words and diagrams in the manuals and reports translate into what actually happens. 
And whilst I can understand the difficulty in using it as a concept, I would have thought that you simply use it until it just clicks in your mind. But apparently not so. Now, one day I'll find one, I hope. Stereoscopic rangefinding as a principle in the US Army dates back at least to the 1920s, but it was only towards the end of World War II that it started being fitted into tanks on an experimental basis. M47 and early M48s were the production tanks which used them. They were replaced in service with the coincidence rangefinders, which were commonly found in a number of countries and also not unusually found in warships. In this case, instead of the lenses being parallel and the marks moving, one entire image is rotated or angled and there are no marks that you're working off. Now, this can either be two images completely superimposed upon each other, so there's a little bit of ghosting of any objects that aren't actually at the set range that your rangefinder is set for, or they may be two half images out of alignment. When the range scale is adjusted to target and the mirror of one of the lenses, normally the right one, is moved to the angle which correlates with the correct range, the images of the target merge into one perfect image. Compared to stereoscopic rangefinders, coincidence rangefinders have advantages and disadvantages. The major advantages are that it doesn't take a hell of a lot of training to use one effectively, um, one report said about two hours, and people who don't have normal depth acuity are able to use them as well. That said, um, slight digression, I've come across another report which says that stereoscopic and coincidence rangefinding can be trained reasonably well in about the same amount of time. Make of that what you will. Both types of rangefinder were considered accurate to about 6% at ranges up to 5,000 yards. So for that earlier example at 2,000 yards, the range error would be only 120 meters. So your impact wouldn't be center mass, but still more of a chance than a hit than not with maybe just over four foot in the difference from the point of aim. There are disadvantages though. The first is that it proved difficult to range against unclear targets, such as those in fog, smoke, or just reasonably well camouflaged with the coincidence rangefinder. This is partially because it's difficult to figure out just where the edge of the second image actually is. Bright sun, other obscurants and the likes tend to blind the operator to the secondary image, the one that's coming through your weak eye. If, at least if they're full image rangefinders with a full image coming in on each lens. And this is a problem that stereoscopic rangefinders don't have. Also, it can be difficult to scan normally using the coincidence rangefinder because there will always be a secondary or ghost image of something at some range kind of cluttering up your view. Stereoscopic rangefinders always show normal vision. However, ease of training and greater universality for tank crew usage led the army to move to coincidence rangefinders in later M48s and M60s. The third type of known base rangefinder is a flicker rangefinder, and that's really more of a variant of the coincidence rangefinder. Only one image is going to be seen at once. A moving mirror changing from one lens to the other between three to 10 times a second would alternate the image being projected into the eyepiece. If the range is not set correctly for whatever it was that you were looking at, the target would appear to move, flickering from one side to the other side. When the range was set correctly, the target appears to be stationary. Now this never got past the experimental stage before it was realized that it was a useless idea. Firstly, one had to lay a reference line precisely on target, and this line will be used to determine if the movement was correctly stopped. I mean, it wasn't required to have this, but it made life much easier for the gunner. The flicker added fatigue to the operator, just basically made him tired. Heat shimmer will result in movement no matter how accurate your range was. And there are also more moving parts in the system, and it was also considered, generally speaking, to be less accurate than the coincidence rangefinder upon which it was based. And in this case, the XM21 flicker rangefinder is basically an M17C coincidence rangefinder with a few more bits installed in the middle. The only time a flicker rangefinder proved noticeably more accurate than the coincidence rangefinder was in low light conditions, reflecting upon the problems of distinguishing between a secondary and primary image when you're using both eyes at once, mentioned a moment ago.
Oh, by the way, not all coincidence rangefinders require to have both eyeballs in use. Stereoscopic certainly does. Coincidence, not always. Uh, still, oftentimes, a secondary image just gets blocked out by your mind. So, coincidence rangefinders it was, until we started moving to time to return systems, or ping systems if you wish. These systems send a signal out, they bounce off the target, and they come back. The great advantages to these are that range estimates are now immediate, and that error is no longer a percentage, but a simple hard number. So by the early 1950s, the US Army was experimenting with radar rangefinders, and if properly calibrated, they said that they would return a range accurate to five yards, no matter how far away the target was, up to 5,000 yards. If not calibrated every day, well, that range error could be up to 20 yards. Hmm, the horrors. The Army identified, however, two major problems with radar rangefinders. The first is the problem of multiple returns. The radar display would show any notable reflections coming along the path of the radar beam, and the gunner would have to reject the obviously wrong ones, and then hope that out of the few possible ranges within reasonable proximity to each other, he uses the correct. Now, this problem was felt to be surmountable. What was considered more problematic was the equipment itself. By the way, that noise in the background, my daughter is visiting from California and herself and the wife have just discovered a floor is lava. I don't know why, I think I, it's rem looking at it briefly, it reminds me of the crystal maze, but not as interesting, no matter. Firstly, uh, back to the two problems, uh, or the, sorry, the second more problematic problem. Radars were considered to be a little bit vulnerable to damage. Anything hitting the antenna at all would basically scupper the whole system. The proposed solution was to mount the antenna well within the tank, aim it at a reflector outside the tank, and then bounce it off that to the target and back. It was figured that the reflector could still perform reasonably well with a few holes in it, and replacing the reflector is a lot easier than replacing an antenna, and cheaper. That was only the first problem, though. The other problem was that in the early 1950s, well, there was no radar equipment which you could fit inside a tank turret to begin with. This problem brought the idea of radar range finding to a screeching halt. In the meantime, promise started to show in the use of light, specifically pulses of infrared light. A spotlight mounted on the outside of the tank would flash a pulse of light and a sensor would then determine how long it took for that light to bounce back from the target. And this became the Optar system as mounted on T95 tanks. Great idea, inadequate execution. Now, not really the engineer's fault, they simply hadn't made the correct scientific advances yet. And the spotlight was moderately vulnerable to fire, the light tended to spread and scatter a bit, resulting in rather a lot of returns and things got even worse if you had smoke or rain. It took the invention of the laser in the 1960s before light ranging became a reasonable option. This beam of narrower, coherent light was less subject to spread, gave fewer returns, worked reasonably well in smoke and rain, and was small enough to be mountable inside the tank. In this particular tank, in the A3 version, it was uh, simply mounted in the right blister. Really, actually, the, the mirror is in the right blister, the laser just fits in next to it. It's still not entirely perfect. There is still a little amount of spread caused by the atmosphere, if nothing else. So if you look at the M1 site, it's considered that the little mill circle in the center of the M1's reticle, it about matches with the spread of the laser. And this is why LRFs should come still with a toggle for at least first and last return, so that the computer picks either the longest distance or the shortest distance which the laser came back with to plug into its ballistic solution. If you recall my M60A3 switchology video, one could select first, second, or last return. So to give a practical example of why this is necessary, if you were aiming at a small target on a ridgeline at 1,000 meters, and behind that target, maybe 500 meters behind, is, say, a building, the laser will likely get returns from both the target at one kilometer and the building at 1500 meters. So you would have to select first return to tell the computer to use 1000 meter calculation. 
On the other hand, if you're aiming at a tank which is in a depression at 1500 meters and you just see its turret, and there's a ridge line between, say, you and his hull at 1000 meters, you may wish to select last return so as to discount the reflection of the laser from the ridge line. A good rule of thumb is to laze low, aim low, in last return or to aim high in first return if you're worried about getting the wrong return back into the system. So there you go, the various methods of determining range. There are, in theory, other methods which can be used, such as measuring angular speed off a target with an estimated direction of travel and speed, but to my knowledge, none of them have been attempted on a tank. So now I get to go back to trying to decipher Soviet armored doctrine. I'm a little overdue on my video for that one, but it's driving me nuts. Hope you found the video interesting and informative. See you on the next one.